Hey everyone, my name is Jack McEnroth and I am from the United States. I uh, am from Seattle, I live in New York and I'm currently working in Oakland, California. I work for an organization called MSMGF at msmgf.org and it's known as the Global Forum on MSM and HIV and we uh, are advocates for men who have sex with men around the world in terms of sexual health and civil rights and discrimination and uh, access to HIV treatment and uh, and all that all that stuff that's desperately needed around the world. I think I bring a really unique perspective to HIV activism because I myself have been HIV positive for uh, 26 years now, gosh, um, since I was 20, and um, I really watched the epidemic change, especially here in the United States, which I'm most familiar. I'm now getting a lot more uh, global perspective. Um, but in the U S it's, 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 you know, steadily improved. Um, the early nineties were very scary and abysmal protease inhibitors. The new medication class of medications came in 1996 with Crixivan, which had its own issues. Um, but recently in the last, you know, a decade, let's say the medications have been much better, um, much more accessible here in the U S. Um, less side effects. And then the most exciting thing I think in the last few years is the advent of, uh, as of PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which HIV negative, uh, men at, well, anyone, but HIV people at high risk, um, which is recommended by the world health organization, anyone at substantial risk, actually, especially MSM men who have sex with men. Uh, and it, you, you take the pill once a day and it's, Basically, you know, as close as you can get to 100% perfect, uh, as close as you can get to 100% uh, in preventing HIV transmission. So that's a very exciting development for us on the fight against the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, I think one of the issues around HIV and HIV issues is that because treatments have gotten better, um, especially in some, some of the, you know, more developed countries, like let's say the United States, for example, that I'm most familiar with, um, you know, it used to be the cause du jour. Elizabeth Taylor was talking about everyone, you know, there were, there were um, fundraisers and celebrities and everyone was wearing a red ribbon and that's gone because you don't see sick people anymore. And that's what pulls up the heartstrings. And that's what gets people really motivated. So it's really hard. It's hard to say to HIV positive people, hey, you should talk about this and you should be vocal about it and you should be vi visible because it will help everyone else. When it's like, oh, but also people, I might get fired from my job or, you know, people, I might not be able to get health insurance or there are, those are real situations. So, you know, it's also a call to action for governments and governing bodies and to put all those protections in place so people can live their truth. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's the, the, it's the million dollar, it's the hundred million dollar question. The billion dollar question is how do we get people to, you know, get, you know, get tested and know their status when we're telling them it's not okay to know. And some of the criminalization laws here are the same. And I think globally it's like, well, you know, and I think in something like 32 states in the United States, you can be put in prison for not disclosing your HIV status when you have sex. So, you know, don't, you know, I don't know the exact statistics on that, but it's something really frightening, which doesn't do anything other than prevent people from getting tested. Because if you don't know you're HIV positive, then you can't lie about it. So it's this vicious cycle. It's like, you know, we need to decriminalize anything having to do with HIV for sure. How I became an activist. Um, I was so young at the time, actually. I, wa I remember ACT UP and all these great organizations doing a lot of work around, around uh, HIV and AIDS. But I was so young. I was only 20 and I was trying to figure out how to go to school and survive in New York City. So I was a little preoccupied with that and HIV and being HIV positive was just another burden to like all this, all the stress I had going on. And I, it was a, it was a strange time because 
the community was really rallying around it, but it was also, there was a lot of desperation and I didn't want to tell my family and there was just a lot going on. Um, so I sat with that. I think I, I told a few friends very early on and then, um, you know, 94, 95, I started to really get okay with it. And then actually I had a, a, a partner named Greg Butler who passed away in 1996. And that was obviously very, very traumatic for me. And that's when I told my mother that I was HIV positive. And then from then on, sort of fast forward, it just became like not a big deal to me. Um, I got, you know, I don't really like to live in shame or embarrassment or, you know, I'm very out about being gay, about HIV, HIV positive. And that, that came surprisingly early for me. And then how I got sort of the uh, national and a little bit of international notoriety is I was on a design show here called Project Runway. And, um, you know, I, in my former career, I was a fashion designer in New York City for 17 years. And when you go on to a show like that, you have to sign away your whole life. And of course, the producers all knew my medical history. And they asked me if I would talk about being HIV positive on the show. And I thought, that's an amazing opportunity for the world in general that doesn't really know that much about HIV necessarily, or doesn't think they do, see a normal, healthy person living their life, being successful, having been positive. I think I was 38 at the time, so it was already 18 years, and I was totally healthy. So that made a huge impact. And um, because of that, after I left the show, I left design. I left fashion design altogether because it, it, brought up something in me that I was like, this is the work I need to be doing. This is desperately needed. I saw the reception I got was, was amazing. People reaching out to me saying, you know, you know, I, I mean, I still to this day have probably once or twice a week, an email or a Facebook message, or, you know, I'm, I'm always coaching like three or four people that are struggling with just finding out or what they should do or don't have access to treatment or medications or, you know, just lots of questions. And so it's been really fulfilling and that's kind of the path I took. Yeah, I think it's really important when, I mean, I've been criticized in social media for being like a little bit too sexy and, you know, but it works for me. Like I am very clear about what my brand is. My brand is, you know, sort of shameless, very sex positive, um, sort of fearless, unabashed. So I, I mix in, you know, sexy pictures because that's what people want to see. Like men, you know, so I'll have two of those. I'll have a couple jokes and then I'll have some HIV messaging. And, and that's how I deliver my message because I'm like, Hey, I'm going to bait you in with a picture of my abs, <laughs> which are really hard to maintain at 46. <laughs> and then I'm going to teach you something. So you know, it's worked really well for me. I mean, I have 120,000 followers on Twitter, and I think my fan page on Facebook has, like, 350,000. So, you know, I, I'm able to get the message out there. And and sometimes I do pull back, because sometimes I know I feel like I'm beating people over the head with it. And then I'm reminded, like, every time I do that, I reach one or two new people that I haven't seen it before. So so that's how I do it. Um, that it, It's about packaging, and it's and and I think when things, you know, get too bogged down in the science and the rhetoric, you lose your audience. Um, one of the campaigns I worked on for last World AIDS Day was called the um, I kind of I, I kind of piggybacked off the, the ALS uh, ice bucket challenge. I was like, how can we do one for HIV? And so I had people uh, take pictures of themselves in the shower and then with, that, with the hashtag, we are all clean, because um, it's not so much here in the U.S. anymore, but you do hear people say if they're HIV negative or uh, have no other STIs that they're clean, um, implying that HIV positive people are somehow dirty. I don't think most people really mean it that way, but that's how it's, it comes off. So, um, yeah, that campaign went crazy. And also... You, the, the key is to get someone to do something that they kind of almost do already. So I just got a bunch of like celebrities and hot guys to do it and it exploded. And I think in a week it had 26 million social media hits. Um, it was translated into like 10 languages. I don't even know. I just, I couldn't even keep up with all the media. Um, you know, 
some big celebrities here. Perez Hilton did it. Whippy, Whippy Goldberg talked about it. Um, Laverne Cox, who's a huge trans activist here, did something about it on Twitter. So it just had, took on a life of its own. In the realm of HIV AIDS, you know, I, I think it is a very exciting time. Um, the advent of PrEP, pre-exposure pro prophylaxis, uh, as a as a as a um, prevention method is like the most exciting development that's happened, you know, in the last 20 years, let's say. So um, we need to work on more access to that for people around the world. There's, you know, I think very few governments that have approved that for, for um, HIV prevention. You know, more and more studies have, have come out that say, that show people that are HIV positive that are on treatment, they, you know, the, the World Health Organization just changed their recommendations for immediate treatment for everyone who's HIV positive where they used to wait. So they've shown, you know, studies to show that your immune system does better when you have early treatment, um, that you, where you can't transmit HIV if you're undetectable and on medication. So all the puzzle pieces are there, you know, if you're HIV positive, get tested, get treated. If you're HIV negative, stay negative. Um, there's more options and ways to do that now. So it's, we have everything that can really end the, H end the AIDS epidemic, but we're not there yet because it's about access and equality and discrimination and, you know, stigma and getting governments on board to support all these people and, you know, marginalized populations need access and there's a lot of barriers to getting there. So the ideal is there and the goal is there, but we're just not there yet. Mm -hmm.